Hey guys, I'm uh, just going to be talking about some facts and figures about knives, and uh, it's going to be informative and interesting and uh, maybe even funny. But uh, up first, we're going to be talking about uh, how America has uh, brands, okay? So uh, companies put a brand on a product to help market that product, and um, a lot of people don't realize, but the oldest brands in America are actually knife companies. And so, um, Case is the oldest brand name in America, followed by Schrade, very closely by Schrade, by the way, and uh, then Utica. So the top three spots are occupied by knife companies. Uh, next up is this knife here. It's a Piranha. Um, American made and they make a pretty good knife it's an auto knife so if you press this button it zips out there really quick and I'll do that again because I know guys just love doing this uh, you could just sit on your couch and do this all day um, but we call these knives uh, switchblades and a lot of people uh, think that George P. Uh, Schrade um, invented the uh, switchblade but in actuality, it was a Sheffield invention and um, came out around 1850. So this knife here is a Benchmade knife. It's a gentleman's knife. Pretty nice. And it's pretty quick too. But it's a liner lock. And if you follow this liner over, it bends over and locks behind the blade so that the knife locks. And um, liner, that's why we call them liner locks. And uh, a lot of people attribute that to uh, Michael Walker, who came out with them, popularized them in, uh, I guess, uh, 1974, 75, something like that. Uh, in actuality, uh, Cataragus patented liner locks in 1906. This is a knife here that's an electrician's knife. And... Um, this style knife uh, guys often refer to as signal core knives and that's because they were used in the signal core in the first world war i don't believe this is a wartime issue knife i think it was a civilian issue but uh it does date to around uh, 1917 probably to 1923. next up this knife here a conic hunting knife and um, this knife was designed by Albert Buck in 1965. It had a lock back. There's a lock for it. And uh, when this knife came out, it was really the nail in the coffin for uh, traditional folders. Within a very short period of time, everybody was wanting a lock back knife. And um, a lot of people believe that, that Albert Buck uh, invented the lock back. Once again, that's not really true. Uh, this knife here, um, this looks a lot like the first Sheffield lockbacks. Uh, they had this big, big uh, lock release right here, and uh, they came out around 19 or 18, um, uh, 1820, sometime around there. And um, this one doesn't date that old. It's 1890 to maybe 1920. It's a George Westing home. But uh, Sheffield invented the lockback and a long time before Buck did. Um, so this knife is a um, Barlow and it's characterized by a, a, a bolster that is a third the size of the uh, total length of the knife. And um, it was invented by Obadiah Bar Barlow in uh, 1667. And short time after that, around like 1670, they were mass producing this knife. And so um, most sources and most people you talk to will tell you that uh, the English first mass produced knives. And um, that's not really true. So um, in 1550, in Thiers, France, this is a French Pradel knife. Um, pretty old. It's not that old, though. Um, in 1550, in Thiers, France, 
was when they first started uh, mass producing knives. They got cutlers in one building performing all the different tasks of building a knife. And they would produce about a thousand knives a month, which is just phenomenal for the Middle Ages. And, um, you know, it's not, uh, Buck produces a hundred thousand uh, a month. So, um, it wasn't a lot, but the, the French were actually, uh, the first ones to really mass produce knives. This knife here is a Leo, um, pretty popular knife. They're pretty cool knives. Uh, what people like about them is uh, a lot of them have work backs. There's a little, um, detail there. This one's a fly. Sometimes they're different. Um, and you can see that the blade is worked there. And, um, uh, the thing about this is, uh, Leos are not a brand. A lot of people think they're a brand knife, but they're a design of knife. And so it's a pattern. And a lot of different places in France made these Leo knives. Uh, nowadays, a lot of them are made in Thiers, uh, which is a nice center in uh, France. But, um, uh, pretty interesting. Um, this knife here is a, a Holly manufacturing company knife and um holly manufacturing started making knives in connecticut in 1844 but they weren't the only ones so uh um connecticut was kind of the cradle of the knife industry in america and a few companies uh popped up and before long there were dozens of them in connecticut the interesting thing is, even though Connecticut was a cradle of uh, American knife making, there's no knife companies in Connecticut today making knives. Uh, so this is a uh, stone, but if you look at it close, it's chipped to this design. And what this is, is an Indian artifact. Um, Native Americans use this. It fits into the palm of your hand and you scrape it like that and you scrape, uh, you know, skin off of an animal. And I have no idea how old this is. Uh, maybe, I don't know. I didn't try to date it. I haven't looked into it. But the point is, um, the oldest um, pocket knife ever found came from... Um, Hallstatt, uh, Austria, I think that's how you pronounce it, and it dated 600 to 500 uh, BC. So uh, pocket knives didn't come about in the 1800s. They are thousands of years old, and that might surprise a few of you. So um, this knife here is a uh, John Russell uh, Barlow, and you see his trademark there. Um, John Russell was um, one of the most important American manufacturers of knives. Uh, he started in 1832 in Connecticut. And um, John Russell was really the first American to directly uh, challenge the supremacy of the English in the American knife market. And he was really successful at it. So um, this is a Shipley uh, model. It looks like a butcher knife, but it's really a hunting um, camp style knife. And these knives were really popular in the 1700s and 1800s. And um, uh, tons of them, these knives came in from England. And uh, this is a type of knife that uh, John Russell made. This is another design of knife that he made. And um, this has three pins, and this is an E.C. Simmons, but I, I think this was probably made by John Russell, this knife here. This is another style knife that John Russell made. And um, he was so successful that the um, British targeted John Russell and dumped knives in America to force him out of business. And in 1873 even though he was one of the most popular knife manufacturers in America, 
and produced a, a lot of knives. He was a very prolific knife maker. Um, he went bankrupt, and that was largely because of British actions uh, against him to drive him out of business. Pretty interesting. So we'll go back to this knife. Um, this is another thing that a lot of people don't realize. Uh, John Russell didn't really start making um, uh, pocket knives until 1875. And uh, that's when uh, he, he went bankrupt and Harrington bought the company and Harrington put pocket knives into production. John Russell did make some pocket knives, but they weren't part of the uh, regular production of his company. So that's pretty interesting there. Um, this is a uh, pouch I bought from Case for my Case knives. And the figure right there, the portrait, is a um, uh, job Case. And he was a patriarch of the Case family. He was the first Case in America and um, immigrated from England. But what a lot of people don't know is Job Case had no association with knives. He was a farmer and a horse trader. And it wasn't until his daughter Teresa married J.B.F. Chaplin that uh, the family became involved in uh, knives. Pretty interesting. Uh, this is a Robitson. And uh, I really like the tortoise. This is simulated tortoiseshell. And I, I really like it. It has green in it. It's kind of different than anything you ever see. Um, but um, Robeson was founded by M.F. Uh, Robeson. And he was a salesman for Rochester Stampin' Works. And he sold knives on the side. And so he um, collected knives and um, uh, put them in, at his house to sell. And he had so many knives that on one sales trip, his wife moved all those knives out onto the porch. And when he came home, uh, of course, he saw all of his knives were on the porch. And uh, shortly after that, he built an addition to his house to put all of his knives in. And I think uh, any of you guys that are married and uh, collect knives can kind of relate to that. That's kind of funny. Um so uh, I, I'll give you a little anecdote about me. So I, I have a lot of knives, uh, uh, traditional folders, modern folders, and um, big splays. I've got uh, close to 900 knives. And um, I'm always buying knives. And uh, my wife says, uh, I don't think you need any more knives. I don't think you need any more. And so uh, one time she cornered me. And um, I agreed not to buy any more knives. And so um, a couple weeks later, I was showing her this sword that I had bought. And she said, I thought we agreed you wouldn't buy any more knives. And uh, I told her, well, honey, this is not a knife. It's a sword. And um, you can kind of imagine how that escalated from there. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Okay. Uh, all right, I'm going to cut the video off there. Um, I hope you guys found it informative. If you did, um, and if you liked it, I'd appreciate it if you like it. And uh, if you'd like to see more content like this, uh, go ahead and uh, subscribe. I'd love to have you to the channel. Remember the truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And I really appreciate you guys watching. Thanks for your support.